Hi, thank you for joining us for this live webinar from uh, London, Germany, and um, all our audience members around the world. Today we'll be going into the analysis of the recent Zimbabwe general election, in which the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission, ZEC, declared Emerson Mungagwagwa, the incumbent and leader of Zimbabwe, um, of Zimbabwe African National Union Patriotic Front, or ZANU PF, the winner of the recent election with 52.6% of the vote. This is compared to 44% for his main rival, Nelson Chamisa, the leader of the opposition Citizens Coalition for Change. Amidst opposition demands for a rerun, we discuss the implications of this important election globally and for the region, as well as the view from the ground from, South, from SADC and South Africa. The new president will have a full in-trade balancing the needs of Zimbabweans by managing the debt position, attracting investment and leveraging the opportunities in the agricultural and mining sectors in a febrile geopolitical setting with an ascendant BRICS. The president will have to choose his new cabinet wisely, particularly for the central bank and the Ministry of Finance. While the African Union and the international community assess the election results, um, should Zimbabweans expect more exclusion from the international community, higher inflation, or economic disarray? Or can Zimbabwe show leadership by turning its economy around and improving its relationships with its regional counterparts and its international creditors and investors? I'm joined on the, pa on the panel today by some brilliant experts. Um, we're very lucky today to be joined by Dr. Nox Chitio, who is uh, an Associate Director on the Africa Program at Chatham House. We've got Professor Sue Onslow, who is a visiting professor at King's College. And we've got Adio Danika, who's a doctoral candidate at the University of Bremen. Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us. And thanks as well to our audience. So on this call, um, Dr. Chitio will take us through Zimbabwe's post-election environment, the foreign policy and political economy, and the wider regional take, as well as the African Union International Observer responses. What do the results mean for Zimbabwe's um, government, old and new political parties, and what we can expect from key appointments? Professor Onslow will then comment on the electoral process, the political economy, and the numbers and details, as well as the foreign policy and wider regional and international responses. Adio will also talk to us about what younger Zimbabweans think of the outcome and what they are hoping the new government will deliver. And then I will do some highlights of the political economy with our speakers. Thank you. Knox, over to you. Thank you, thank you very much, Desi. Thank, thank you for the invitation. Hello to you all out there. Uh, first, I just one very minor correction, which is that I'm uh, Associate Fellow, Chatham House, um, not uh, Associate Director, but thank you very much. Happy to be here. Um, okay, so I'm going to look at Kind of elections, the um, the economy, and the wider uh, international arena. So, um, Des has pointed out the results in the presidentials. Um, the incumbent won 52.6 percent. Chamisa 44 percent. Also, in the National Assembly, which is Parliament, uh, the results are quite interesting. There's 280 seats in the National Assembly. Um, as at the moment, Zanzibar have uh, 170. Six seats, the triple C, that's Nelson Chamisa's party, have 103 seats. Um, so uh, 141 seats are needed for a majority. So Zanupia have a working majority uh, in parliament now. It's not the two thirds majority from 2018, but they have a working majority. And so that's the one takeaway. The second takeaway is that the triple C, uh, Nelson Chamisa's party, are now the second largest party in parliament. Thirdly, um, no other party or independent candidate won a seat in the National Assembly um, at these elections. So at parliamentary level, this election has brought a return to two-party politics, uh, which is different from what happened in 2018, because 2018 elections, um, there were two other parties uh, with, uh, who had uh, MPs, plus there was an independent candidate. An independent MP, i.e., Temba um, so Sorry, Knox, to interrupt you. Sorry, Knox, to interrupt you. Um, your audio has gone a bit crackly. I'm really sorry to interrupt you. Do you think you could um, 
maybe close any extra windows that you have open. Okay. All of a sudden, your audio is going crackly. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Sorry for the crack up. I'm on my phone. So okay, that's a that's a little yeah. bit better. Sorry to interrupt. Please continue. Sorry. Okay. No, yeah. that's a, okay. Uh, my apologies. Um, on the phone. So, uh, so we we're basically back to a two-party uh, parliament, which is quite interesting. Um, and the question begs the question: Will this two-party? We have two large parties in parliament. Uh, will this lead to a vibrant parliament uh, with parliamentary delivery to constituencies and to the people? or will it lead to parliamentary deadlock? I think that's one um, of the, the questions. Um, the, the voter registration for 2023 elections was uh, a record registration. But interestingly, there was a lower voter turnout up this time. Um, so again, that's quite interesting. Um, we are all aware of the various issues and procedural um, on process and uh, procedure that have been flagged up. I'm not going to go into that in the interest of time. Um, ZEC, uh, Zimbabwe Electoral Commission, have acknowledged some of the issues, but they insist that they fulfilled their mandate to deliver credible elections. Um, Triple C and, and uh, other organizations, though, um, say that uh, they beg to differ, and they say that the poll rerun is the only way forward. So basically what we have is another disputed poll, which kind of continues the tradition of harmonized, but not necessarily harmonious elections. Um, legally, the Triple C had um, seven working days to chat the results. They haven't done so, so the results um, will stand. So what does this mean in real terms, in terms of the um, elections? Basically, the elections are done. There isn't going to be a rerun. And then the next general elections are scheduled for 2028. 20, 20, we will, though, probably see um, ZEC, the Triple C, perhaps Sunapir, and certainly civil society organizations releasing their elections reports over the coming weeks and months. And that should be quite interesting. Uh, um, I think there will also be contestation uh, um, in Parliament around constitutional and um, the electoral reforms between now and 2028. The issue of the NGOs and government, I think, will continue to reverberate going forward. Um, it might be useful in in future at some future point to have some kind of dialogue between government and the NGOs uh, to try and resolve some of the various issues. Um, just to move on quickly to the economy, uh, the government I think, can point to some positives. Um, uh, I, I was there. The electricity situation is is a lot better than it was um, even just a few months ago. Um, uh, one hopes that it's going to be sustainable, but certainly uh, now that one has come on the stream, the one key power station, the electricity situation is a lot better. Uh, but also, the Zimbabwe dollar uh, has relatively stabilised over the past few months. Um, after crashing earlier this year. Agriculture has rebounded. There have been record um, harvests. Horticulture uh, and exports are, are thriving. Mining sector is doing well. I saw a lot of construction going on um, in, in the country. However, there are a lot of challenges. The currency is what currency volatility is a major, major issue. We have a, There's a dual currency. Um, and there's also debate around the dual currency, Zimbabwe and, and US dollar currency. Uh, so the debates continue. There's high inflation, and this also impacts on salaries and cost of living. Um, the public health sector, uh, I think we're all aware, I don't need to go into detail, but the hospitals, um, that really needs um, addressing uh, with regards to the public health sector. Private health sector is a, is a rather different story because that seems to be actually moving up. Uh, but but private, uh, public health sector and education sector are issues as well. Um, skills flight including especially in the health sector and teaching. There's been aggressive recruitment by global recruiters. Um, so a lot of Zimbabweans, especially the young Zimbabweans, uh, and I'm sure I will speak more to this as well, um, have left the country or are, are, are leaving the country. And this, I think, is, is an issue. There is, I would say, a cost of living crisis um, in Zimbabwe. But, you know, I wouldn't, this is not just particular to Zimbabwe. There's a global recession. There's a global cost of living crisis. Here in the UK, there's a cost of living crisis as well. So, I, you know, it's not just in Zimbabwe. But I think it hits hard um, in Zimbabwe because, because the economy was already um, hard here. Okay, thank you very much, Please. Knox. Uh, Knox, I'm going, to, I'm going to stop you there because um, hopefully you can sort your audio out. It really is um, not great. 
and I don't. Um, I want to make sure that um, all of our listeners can can join us. Um, if it's okay with you, I'll come back to you um, at the end, and then uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna hand over uh, to to Professor Onslow. And uh, okay. thank you very much um, for for those points that you did make. I mean, if you could just mute mute your audio, please. Uh, not please mute your audio. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, Hi, um, Sue, thanks very much for joining us. Um, I wonder if you'd like to maybe pick up um, on some of the points that Knox made, also for the benefits um, of our audience who maybe didn't hear um, everything so clearly um, during during some of the, the audio there. So, I mean, uh, Knox ch uh, touched on the economy somewhat. He touched a little bit, just gave us the kind of general overview, the setting, the challenge uh, from the opposition. Um, but of course, there's been quite a robust response uh, from SADC, as we were saying um, while we were logging on to the call. Um, you know, the Commonwealth maybe uh, not as uh, vocal as expected, the African Union as well as Weyden. Can, can you give us a sense of, um, okay, just, you know, sum up, um, you know, the, the, the political economy implications, the international reaction, and um, and then I may have some more questions for you, and anything else you, you feel free to, to tuck in. Thank you very much, Desney, and thank you, Knox. Uh, I'm um, impressed by what you say about um, the, the return to two-party politics and the potential, although ZANU-PF does have a working majority in um, Parliament, that's both the National Assembly and also the Senate, about whether there will be a return to parliamentary deadlock. I think that there are two aspects here. It's what are the implications in the committee structures, because it's not just on the floor of the House of the National Assembly and the Senate where debate will take place, but it's also in the structures of Parliament. Um, I also think that what we've seen in the 2023 election is a, a re-emergence of the succession problems, because of course the, the incumbent is 80, the vice president uh, Chiwenga is also elderly. So are we seeing over the next five over the next five years, will we see a rerun of the succession problems and the infighting within ZANU PF that after all beset the party um, in the uh, after the 2013 elections? Um, so um, I think that we definitely need to watch this space. I don't want to to get into the the, uh, the weeds, if it, as it were, of the, uh, the the factions and political infighting. But I do think that the, the the political environment is going to affect the Zimbabwean political economy to a particular degree. Um, I agree with Knotts about the um, the positive uh, the positive voices, the positive aspects. Um, of the the not so new government record from 2018, um, that ZANU PF um, had sorted out a number of budgetary problems that had impeded progress in previous decades. Um, uh, under the stewardship of Minister of Finance um, Mtuli Mkube, um, Zimbabwe had managed a balanced budget. The civil service salary budget was under control. It had posed a huge strain on public finances in the past. And um, Zimbabwe has made uh, steps towards sorting out its infrastructural problems. But um, the question of triple digit inflation, um, is it coming under control? Sh will it be at an acceptable level uh, by year end as economists, veteran economists such as Eddie Cross speculate, um, or whether this is going to continue to uh, reflect the significant structural problems within the Zimbabwean economy? And it does of course face huge challenges uh, in terms of GDP per capita, Zimbabwe is still below what uh, the country was at independence in 1980. The country is still trying to recover from being particularly hard hit by the COVID-19 pandemic, um, despite the government stimulus package um, and also the um, emergency humanitarian aid, which um, the Manangagwa government applied for. Um, the health and education systems are in shambles. Um, and that's, of course, the public um, health and education. It was Hopewell Chinoyo, uh, Chinonio, of course, who exposed massive um, government corruption by the Ministry of Health um, around procurement of um, uh, anti-COVID-19 materials. Uh, corruption and state capture are endemic, and there is a, a continual need in Zimbabwe for constitutionalism. There is the aspect of continued militarization of public institutions since 2018, which of course has continued the trend of zanification of the state since the early 2000s and the, the, the placing of the military. 
um, within public institutions. So a further conflation of military, political and economic spheres. Um, there is this question around centralization of power under the executive presidency and a weakening of independent oversight mechanisms. Zimbabwe also is particularly reliant on the informal economy. I take Knox's point that uh, the country's experience of a cost of living crisis is not peculiar to the country, but um, the Zimbabwean uh, working population are particularly susceptible. Uh, the informal sector comprises 85% of the workforce, and most informal workers are in agriculture, trading, or mining. Um, so according to the IMF, Zimbabwe has the second largest informal economy. But I think the greatest problem, and this is directly associated with the uh, implications and outcomes, the optics of the election, is this question of Zimbabwean indebtedness. Um, because it has, I think, the potential for distraction of focusing on what is needed in terms of institutional reform, which would enable Zimbabwe to reach out to uh, the, um, the IFIs um, to actually address its substantial debt arrears. Now, when I say substantial, the figures vary, but um, according to the African Development Bank, um, Zimbabwe's total consolidated debt amounts to US dollars 17.5 billion, and the debt to international creditors stands at US dollars 14 point zero four billion and domestic debt is US dollars three point four billion. So there's debt to the international institutions, to bilateral creditors, um, and Zimbabwe um, owes China US dollars two point three billion, mostly in the infrastructure sector. The country is committed to servicing its debt. Um, it's been announced that it would pay off all external debts by 2025, but I think that is a very tall ask. And the impact of the, the discussions around the legitimacy, the public reputation of the um, successful ZANU-PF government and, um, and its incumbent, I think could influence the private diplomacy, but it's the reputation, the potential reputational damage um, to domestic civil, civic trust and independence of state in institutions, which the IFIs have demanded uh, reform in. As you pointed to, Desni, the um, African Union and particularly SADC have been surprisingly critical of um, the electoral process. And I, I, uh, those are, the interim reports are available online. The final reports have gone uh, particularly to SADC um, organs and they will be discussed um, at foreign minister level and then they may or may not be raised to the SADC summit. But I think here there's a question of, of SADC abided by the established electoral oversight protocols, despite whatever George Taramba said, criticizing um, the uh, SADC head of mission, who is a, a very well respected Zambian politician and, um, and religious um, leader. Um, so that the I think that the, the potential damage of this spat within SADC, and it's more than a spat, I should say, um, could have uh, implications precisely because of this question of legitimacy. Um, Zimbabwe's application to rejoin the Commonwealth um, is also under discussion. The Commonwealth was less critical in its observation report. The African Union has noted its criticism, but unlike Gabon's coup, and Gabon has been suspended, Zimbabwe has not been suspended from the councils of, of the African Union. So um, I, certainly there has been diplomatic fallout, and I think that this has a potential knock-on effect of Zimbabwe's effective and sustained international re-engagement, which is critical for um, oh, right, the, its image, its reputation, which it needs if it is to boost foreign direct investment. So um, the potential damage uh, is not insignificant. Thank you, Sue. That was incredibly uh, thorough um, and I really uh, enjoyed and appreciated listening to that. Um, I have I have a few few questions um, just before we, we hand over to Adio. I mean, um, I mean, of course, you know, the, the China and the BRICS, um, there's obviously um, the kind of um, Anglo, Anglo um, American um, foreign relations, but there's also, um, you know, this whole alternative world um, that the Global South um, is, is putting forward on the global agenda. Zimbabwe, um, it, of course, you know, there's uh, lots of uh, foreign investment opportunities, um, from the UK, the US, but of course there's, you know, you did touch a um, little bit on, on debts to China, but let's talk about sort of, um, 
you know, certainly the fact that maybe China's more agnostic on some of the issues in the political economy, as well some of the other BRICS countries and other BRICS plus. Uh, let's maybe just talk about that kind of um, uh, more diverse um, setting uh, geopolitically. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Disney. Um, in terms of foreign relations, I think the question of continuing sanctions continues to be a toxic element of Zimbabwe's relations with the EU, with, with um, the former colonial power, Britain, and also with the United States. Now, these sanctions are vestigial, it could be said. They're highly targeted. The EU has, um, of course, an arms embargo. It has um, a, a very specific list of individuals whose assets are frozen and who, for whom there is a travel ban. For the UK, it is targeting only two individuals and one entity. The United States is more embracing with 60 uh, Zimbabweans um, of the, the political military elite on its list and 39 entities. But it is the, the, the um, if you like, a conditioning a damage. I talked to a uh, South African about this, about saying, con considering how the, the, the sanctions are deliberately targeted to minimize the impact on ordinary Zimbabweans. Um, so then, in other words, that those who are identified to be particular tran transgressors in terms of human rights abuses and, and, um, and political repression should be the, the object of, of these sanctions. Um, and he said, on the contrary, it is the, the aspect of what it gives to, the, the flavor of what it gives to the a foreign investment environment of the entire region. And of course, Zimbabwe definitely lags behind others as SADC countries in terms of foreign direct investment. So the, the, the rhetoric around sanctions, which has been used by the ZANU-PF government and continues to be so, um, blaming the international uh, community for Zimbabwe's economic woes, which is of course not the case. However, it is, uh, it's been used as political leverage. In terms of the BRICS, of course, Zimbabwe, um, under the, the quote, not so new government um, of 2018, did embark upon a, an international charm offensive and uh, deliberately uh, instituted reforms to make it the, the international, uh, the, the political economy of the country more attractive to investors. But it's still, there remains a lot to be done. Um, it's by no means a particularly uh, you know, overwhelmingly attractive um, environment because there is doubt about the political consistency. There is doubt about property rights, despite the, the measures that it's brought in. Um, and also the question of weak institutions. So, uh, no matter that their important reforms have been instituted to make it a more attractive investment environment, there still remains in the eyes of a number of external investors um, more to be done. Your point about uh, China, of course, is, is particularly important, um, that China had, was the lender of last resort for the Mugabe government. Um, China um, has, a, of course, a well-known lack of conditionality um, to its investments. I made reference to its particular investment in Zimbabwean infrastructure. Um, China also seek, uh, stands to benefit particularly from the development of lithium mining. And there are 500,000 Zimbabwean um, uh, workers in the artisanal or mining sector. It's a particularly large in aspect of the informal economy. And there have been very uh, concerning instances of rising violence by gangs associated with political actors against artisanal miners. So um, I must admit, I am cons personally concerned that there risks being um, another a repetition of Zimbabwe um, which has uh, extraordinary mineral resources, not necessarily benefit, the, the Zimbabwean exchequer will not necessarily benefit uh, to the extent that it should, just as there was leaching and corruption around the Moranji alluvial diamonds um, extraction. So um, it's, a, it's a complicated picture um, and a great uh, more remains to be done. And um, But there are key figures in the ZANU-PF um, okay, political structures who are aware of this, but also this question of endemic corruption. Zimbabwe has the, uh, the institutions, it has the legislation to address them, to address this issue of corruption, but it's precisely because it is, is failing to do so, which is complicating the picture. Sorry, Desi, I apologize, your, your microphone's on mute. Sorry, <laughs> um, I'm, I was trying to be quiet as a mouse as you're talking, and I was too quiet. Um, Adia, I saw you nodding uh, while Sue was um, talking about um, some of the issues uh, regarding uh, China, and uh, I, I don't know if you want to comment um, on, on any of that. Wait. Um, 
Well, yes. When she was talking about um, China, I'm I'm I mean I'm I'm a well established critic of the Chinese involvement in Zimbabwe, uh, particularly as a young person. Um, the reason being uh, in that when you look at um, the European investment in or the American generally the Western investment in Zimbabwe's mining sector, when we get back to the years, you know, we can point to towns like Bindura, we can point to towns like uh, Kwekwe as having come out of the mining initiatives of these um, Western powers or of former colonial powers. And then when you look at China, I would want one person to point to me one place where they say, ah, yeah, we have that town developing as a result of Chinese investments. So as Sue was talking about this, and as a young person in Zimbabwe, I am gravely concerned by uh, the recent election outcome, which, of course, as a young person, we were hoping, um, hope against hope, of course, that um, the incumbent would not win because their dalliance with the Chinese does not inspire any confidence within the Zimbabweans. Because when you look at things like the displacement of people from... Um, from different places in Zimbabwe, we have been displaced from um, Uzumba, Maramba, Fungwe, one of the Sanopiev's um, strongholds where there are more people than, I don't know, I don't believe there are those people there. But we even saw Chinese people kicking out villagers from these places saying, you don't have title deeds, but I, a person from Guangzhou or Shandong or wherever, have title deeds and have the right to kick you, an indigenous Zimbabwean, from the land. So when Su was talking about this Chinese um, investment and all and this whole, I was just remarking and trying to think, what then does the future hold for us as this chi China Zanu PF dalliance increases? Yeah, because um, that's a, a very good point, Adia. Because I think that the space, um, the operating space, will tighten uh, with regard to the EU. UK um, and, and the US um, and perhaps some of the other uh, G7 G7 countries. As you're talking about the mining sector, I, I just want to kind of touch on lithium, which um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on that, which is a sector that the government um, seems to be quite optimistic about. Um, and then we've also got some questions uh, from our audience, which I'll, I'll get to in a second. But just um, lithium, um, any thoughts on, on, on that? Adia, you look like you want to say something? Um, yes, um, so thoughts definitely. But however, um, to be honest, um, I, I wish and hope I was more, I was equally as optimistic as the government is. I simply am not because um, if history is anything to go by, we were optimistic when diamonds were uh, discovered in Chiazwa, um, the, the Maranga diamond fields. And uh, former finance minister and IBT is on record saying nothing is coming into the, into the treasury. And um, for those in the north, immediately when the locals went to get diamonds there and try and develop themselves, immediately there was a crackdown titled Operation Mariwa Kaiwanepi as an operation where you get the money. And people were persecuted. And we all know uh, the dalliance again of the Chinese, particularly Chinese military, and the Zimbabwean military in the Chiazo diamond fields. So when I look at lithium, of course, because we are moving towards electric vehicles, we are moving towards um, these more sustainable uh, forms of energy utilization. It means lithium has the chance to become a very good, a very big thing. I think in Germany, the term they're using is uh, vices gold, which means white gold. So generally, there should be a sense of optimism that we have a very large um, deposit of lithium, so this should tend to benefit the country. But you see, when... Um, the same people who were in charge when the Chiazo diamonds were discovered and we were hopeful and nothing came out of it are the same people in charge now. I think Albert Einstein said something about um, the celebrated definition of stupidity, being um, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. I, of course, remain, have this, you know, hope is like pain. If I step on your foot, it demands to be felt, whether you want to feel the pain or not. So we definitely have hope that maybe they will see the light and the lithium will really contribute to our fiscus and the de development of Zimbabwe. But that is exactly what it is, hope. Well, one of our audience members, so I'll come to you in a moment, maybe you can respond to one of our audience members have uh, done a China lithium link here. And uh, Dani Harwood um, has, is asking us, I have read that China is about to establish lithium 
refining mm -hmm. and battery manufacturing in Zimbabwe, the type of move up the value chain that many in Africa and abroad say is critical for development and poverty reduction, please comment. Um, if I uh, I can just comment briefly, I've, I've certainly read a report that dis, uh, despite um, Zimbabwean domestic legislation, which is uh, in, designed to ensure that there should be domestic processing um, of li uh, lithium products, the, the likelihood is that, the, that China will be able to circumvent these and to export, in other words, raw lithium and process it in China so that the maximum benefit for this extractive process will accrue to Beijing rather than to Harare, exactly as Adio has pointed out. So um, just as Zimbabwe has, after all, on the statute book, the indigenization uh, legislation, which is precisely to make sure that there isn't a repetition of alienation of of vital natural resources of, to make you know to address the, the, the problems that was besetting around land around the extractive industries um it's not simply that there is there is a lack of legislation it's a question of implementation and constitutionality so it's again it goes to what are practices of corruption and this is a practice of corruption by a particular military economic political elite which circumvents the laws of the country with impunity so um, this is the likelihood of, of doing this again is, I'm afraid, very high indeed. Yeah, well, I mean, just um, I don't know what happens um, in Zimbabwe with some of the opportunities that China presents, but certainly when, um, when I was in Namibia uh, a while ago, one of the problems um, that they had on the border of Angola is when they are Chinese mines or, or factories is that China actually brings in some of its own workers and um, the, the opportunities don't, even the, the um, employment opportunities sometimes do not accrue um, to uh, ordinary Zimbabweans. And um, so I, mean, I, I, I don't know how hopeful we can be about the auditing um, of, of that kind of activity, but I mean, certainly a concern in terms of that um, bringing people out of poverty. Often, you know, China will bring in its own workers uh, from, from, the, from its uh, mainland. Um, just returning to the election itself, um, maybe we, we can see from Knox has um, sorted out its audio. His audio. Uh, I don't want to forget about this question, um, so just to move away from the um, economy, uh, somebody's asked what are the factors that have contributed to the low voter turnout in the just concluded general election? Um, I don't know if we can just, um, um, Adio, do you want to do do comment first and then, then we'll, we'll hand over to Knox and Sue. Um, so of course, um, generally there, there is the um, out, out, there was there is, there, there is the obvious thing of, of, of water apathy because uh, elections have routinely failed to deliver any change for Zimbabweans since as far back as uh, you would want to go. So definitely that contributes to the apathy. But of course, the most glaring and I think maybe this should get into the Guinness Book of Records <laughs> was the situation where people showed up at a ballot at at, 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 at the polls, at the polling stations. And ballot papers were simply not there. I mean, I I knew Zanu PF was going to rig the election, but when I was talking to people and they were saying, "Yeah, we are there, but there are no ballot papers," I was like, "Is this some kind of sick joke or what?" Because uh, you know, in deep um, in Mola, in deep um, Kariba rural district council, the ballot papers were there, but in Glenora, three kilometers from the Zeg head office, there were no ballot papers, and there was simply no explanation. So that already has a bearing on um, the law of voter turnout. And of course, the crazy um, flyers which were displayed during the night, were, which Chamisa's first saying, do not go and vote. I mean, I often am on record saying that um, we overestimate um, the intelligence of the average person out there. So when you see a poster with Chamisa's face saying, do not go and vote, and then Faz comes in and saying, uh, we are watching you, that will also contribute to the law of voter turnout. I think this is from my observations. Nox, um, shall we see how, uh, oh, Sue looks like she wants to jump in. Sue, do you um, want to jump in? Just yeah. to say also that there was the lack of oversight of the, the registration of the electoral roll, because Zach posted access to the roll at such a high figure that there wasn't the possibility of checking for anomalies and uh, you know for dead voters being registered so uh, for, for legitimate voters being missed off for whatever reason so you couldn't check for the veracity of the existing voters role in addition to the problems that adio has identified 
Knox, do you want to um, comment on the low voter turnout? What were the reasons? Thank you. Um, I hope you can hear me. So I've been having a lot of problems. <laughs> okay, that's better than before. So maybe just stay in that spot. Yeah, yeah. With, with my tech. Anyway, yes, uh, I think um, Adio and Sue have um, outlined some of the, the anomalies, which definitely played um, a part, particularly um, in Harare and, and Bulawayo, I think. Um, people were not able to vote. But I would also flag the issue of uh, voter apathy. Um, I think that is a, a big issue because when you look at the figures, um, about six and a half million people registered to vote, of which maybe four and a half million actually mm -hmm. voted on the day, which is about two million people who did not vote. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, definitely some of those people uh, came to the, vo the, the voting booths on the day, but were not able to vote for various reasons. But I also, um, with sp having spoken to people, a lot of people actually just maybe registered, but just did not bother to, to go on the day for various reasons, either because they believed it might not change anything or for, for various other reasons. So I think going forward, this is something that all the parties have to, to look at. Um, why, are, why are people actually not going to vote? Uh, because I think this, this is, it, it is a factor. Voter apathy, I think, is a major factor. Well, maybe it's the inevitability that might have been a factor. Um, just my, my view. Um, yeah, and then we have staying with the voting. Um, thanks very much, guys, um, for, for our, our panel, um, who's excellent. And I, I'm learning quite a lot as well myself. It's just staying with the voting. We've got a question from Stanley Mabuka, who says, um, South Africa seemed to be on the side of the regime while it decries the influx of immigrants. Any idea what it is seeking to achieve? I mean, okay, first of all, is South Africa on the side of the regime and yeah who wants to take this one Knox do you maybe see as how you and then we'll come to see Knox yeah okay well I'll uh, a few things first of all obviously um, the Zimbabwe government South Africa ANC is uh, uh, you know there's the liberation solidarity um, a across the, the region so I think that is one um, reason uh, but, you know, having, having said that, um, you know, the South Africans were in, um, in the SADC um, observer mission and they, they did not critique the, um, the, the, the criticism which was raised by the SADC uh, observer mission. So I think we need to qualify when we say that the South Africans are, you know, totally on, on the side of South Africa. I think the South Africans did have some issues, but I think overriding that is um, liberation, solidarity. And if I may, just with regards to SADC, South Africa, and so on and so forth, in the 2000s, Zimbabwe was the dominant issue for SADC throughout the decade. And it, it led to a lot of what I call Zimbabwe fatigue within, within SADC. Um, and, you know, culminating in the 2008 and, and the, the, the GNU which followed, SADC and South Africa are not keen for Zimbabwe to once again become the dominant um, issue within um, SADC. And, you know, we may agree with that, we may critique it, but, you know, having spoken with, with some of the diplomatic uh, community, they, they really don't want a repeat of the 2000 where it was all about Zim, every SADC meeting. So I think that may be um, a factor as, as well. I could say more, but perhaps I'll leave um, Sue and and Adi, Adi would say, I'll, I'll perhaps say more a bit later. Yeah, maybe we'll come back to this because um, you know, just um, it's it's, it's just say, Desney, that yeah. the issue, of course, also for for South Africa is it's facing um, its own significant election next year, and so there there is the aspect of it. It certainly doesn't want to to pour petrol on potential flames of of, of drawing in. Um, you know, comment on election observation, as you say, Ramaphosa definitely noted the criticisms from SADC and from the AU, and yet he was highly prominent in his uh, his presence at the inaugural ce celebrations on Monday. So I think it's a question, I don't think that they're necessary, they aren't necessarily hand in glove, but South Africa doesn't want to go out on a limb, no matter that um, the Secretary General of the ANC, Mbalula, Mbalalu, sorry, um, um, Balula, uh, managed to persuade the Oliver Tambo Leadership School at Witz to postpone uh, Professor Ivo Mandaza's uh, keynote lecture on democracy across the SADC region, uh, which was uh, yesterday featuring prominently on, on SABC News. 
So um, I th South Africa is proceeding with caution, I think, on this and, and definitely doesn't want to go out on a limb. And I take Knox's point about this question of Zimbabwe fatigue and it doesn't want to get back into the, 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 the highly problematic um, and disputatious diplomatic fallout um, of the early 2000s. Thank you so much. No, I, I was just um, laughing when, when Knox is talking about Zimbabwe fatigue. I mean, it's not it's not funny, of course, but mm -hmm. I mean, but also I think an important, I mean, because I just remember that being the predominant issue, certainly when I, I was growing up um, in, in South Africa in the late um, 1990s and early 2000s. But also I think the important point about liberation, solidarity, you know, of course, because also when it comes to Russia, people can't understand why South Africa is um, not being, you know, as hostile um, as maybe the G7 allies w would like or non-aligned, um, you know, as, as, um, as it goes. But, you know, the, these ties uh, run quite deep and um, I think SADC has, um, it's not that it's been completely softly, softly, you know, it's also like if somebody is your, your friend or your neighbor and is doing wrong, you can persuade, you can influence, you can try to lobby in other ways, you know, instead of maybe uh, just a stick um, when, when you, uh, Adio, do you want to comment on South Africa before we, um, we, we move on? Yes, I think I would, I would like to comment, uh, particularly um, draw attention to the deplorable acts of um, uh, Figile Mbalula, who has been really acting like an excitable um, paid troll, um, particularly the way he's celebrating the ZANU-PF um, victory is actually more than the ZANU-PF um, people themselves, which of course begs the question, um, why is he mourning more than the bereaved? Like, what does he stand to benefit? Of course, uh, rumors have been flying around why I will not um, venture into conjecture or touch on those. But I think I also want to draw attention to why I'm saying I'm finding particular exception to his acts. is because historically, ZANU was never really an ally mm -hmm. of the ANC. Mm -hmm. It was ZAPU. Exactly. Of course, some might much argue that ZANU and ZAPU merged and all, all this, but I mean, uh, we all know what really happened, right? So when you see ANC and ZANU now seemingly acting like allies, the question is, I think as uh, Chino Achebe once said, when you see uh, a toad crossing the road in broad daylight, something is after its life. So the question is why? I would then ask, uh, on the, I would then start to say, we have seen the wave of change in Sadak. It happened in Malawi. Um, when uh, the pastor, what's his name, Chakwera came in. It happened in uh, Zambia when Haka Inde Ishilema came in. And now that same wave was threatening to come to Zimbabwe. And what's next? On who's next? South Africa. Mm -hmm. So to be honest, ANC's act, uh, especially Figile Mbalula's um, um, dra dramatic acts, are simply an act of self-preservation, where they feel that if ZANU-PF is uh, taken out of power in Zimbabwe, that sends a message across Saturn that it's possible to remove these um, former liberation movements from power. And also, if you also listen to what Mbalula has said um, on other different other forums after the win of, of um, the ZANU-PF win, he has, he has said, oh, yes, we are, we, we are allies with ZANU-PF, and you know the West is after us liberation movements. I mean, I find that argument of saying the West is coming to influence me to vote against ZANU-PF quite insulting, to be honest, because um, uh, whoever, whoever, like, okay, I don't know, who's, um, Richie Sunak is not going to come and whisper in my ear that there's no electricity in my house. He won't come and whisper that there's, that um, uh, Munangagwa is officially opening uh, mortuaries, officially opening boreholes in Zimbabwe. I don't need to be told by a Western person there. So the whole idea of saying we are being influenced by Western puppets, I find that really insulting. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, let's talk, let's try and just talk about um, what there is to be optimistic about. Um, and also, you know, people have to live there um, on a day-to-day -day basis. It's just what I kind of, we know what the problems are. I mean, uh, you know, um, having been born in South Africa, of course, you know, the view from the UK, it's, you know, um, we always think, it, in, in our, even in the UK, people think that the political problems here are, terrible, insurmountable, the worst ever in the world, you know, so I think each country, obviously, we take um, wherever we live, the, the 
the the issues you know are, we take them to heart but at the same time people live um in zimbabwe like they do in south africa when you you do go to south africa zimbabwe on the ground you know there there are also there are things also to be optimistic about which brings me to one of the questions um that an audience member from karen moda who has asked a question about tourism and of course the stunning vic falls um she asks um, whether tourism in Zimbabwe will remain mainly concentrated in Vic Falls. Um, I don't know, Knox, do you want to take this? It seems you've just been there. I mean, what are the beauty spots? Um, what else is there to do? Do you just want to take Karen's question, please? Thank you. Um, although I'll invite colleagues also to, to chip in on this. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the Vic Falls is like the um, tourism um, hotspot in, in Zimbabwe. And of course, they've also set up the Victoria Falls Stock Exchange um, as well, which kind of um, adds value. So Vic Falls, uh, Lake Car Kariba, which also shared with, uh, and both these are shared between, of course, between Zimbabwe and Zambia. Um, also the, um, the highlands um, in, in Eastern um, Zimbabwe, there's mana pools and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, areas around Bulawayo as well, which are often not, not mentioned, but in southern uh, Zimbabwe, there's a lot of cultural and uh, tourism um, areas there. So there are a lot of areas and tourism actually is one of the areas which um, has actually done relatively well, despite all the problems that uh, Zimbabwe has had. Just this last year, tourism really has picked up um, over, the, over the past few years. So um, there is uh, a lot of uh, tourism available. Um, I think now that the currency has stabilized, although it's relative, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that also helps uh, with, with regards to, to tourism. But you know, I think there's more that, that can be done with regards to Zimbabwe tourism. I think one of the good things is that despite the tensions between Zimbabwe and Zambia, the two countries actually economically um, and in terms of development, they signed some development accords last year the two countries actually are sharing some of their tourism um, um, aspects uh, as as jointly because they they're setting up as a joint infrastructure hub and tourism hub within um, the SADC region. So I think that's also worth uh, worth noting. But I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Um, so, Adia, do you want to comment on the tourism? I can't comment on that. Yeah. Okay. Adia, any thoughts? Uh, well, definitely, I agree with uh, with Knox that uh, the tourism sector in Zimbabwe is perhaps one of the mm -hmm. the, um, the silver linings in the in the generally dark cloud because um, I mean there are certain things that um, because mainly the reason being mainly Zimbabwe's tourism is nature based, so um, it really needs great political um, mischief, mischief to 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 mess up the the the, the natural aspects of the tourism. So I think that uh, it will not only remain concent concentrated in Victoria Falls, because I can say uh, with a reasonable um, certainty or authority that the Zimbabwe Tourism Authority is really trying to go to great lengths to promote the country um, as far mm. as tourism wise. So yeah. my hope definitely is that if the, the politics sort of stabilizes, particularly the issue of the currency that uh, Knox mentioned, and also there is uh, it's investment in the road networks because our roads are in a bad state. I drove to Victoria Falls last year and I regretted it. But of course, when you get there, the falls are beautiful. So I think if the government uh, fixes those issues, like the, particularly the road networks, because we, I, I, in another group that I'm that, that I a, a part of, the Zimbabwe Youth in Tourism, uh, we have tried lobbying the government to try and improve the, particularly the road to Victoria Falls as well as the general road network. So I believe tourism will not only be concentrated in Victoria Falls, but also other places that we have in Zimbabwe. Thanks very much um, for that idea. I mean, just to touching on, on nature and uh, natural capital, um, you, you'll be aware as well that the um, Africa Climate Summit and Africa Climate Week is just taking place uh, in Kenya right now. And of course, that like, nature-based uh, financial solutions are big news for Africa at the moment, including carbon markets, um, which uh, many countries are pushing now via the African Carbon Markets Initiative. Zimbabwe, of course, um, in a way, nationalized its carbon markets um, and really, um, you know, kind of, uh, what's the word, <laughs> set the, the cat amongst the pigeons um, 
for this opportunity, but um, you know, hopefully that'll also um, you know, but they kind of had to roll back a little bit, you know, realizing that you know if they want to participate in these opportunities, they've got to kind of float um, you know, uh, these things to the, the global economy. Um, we have some questions, some further questions, and I will come to Nkosi's question and Kunbarai's question. But what I would like to, um, you know, the thing is, um, while we're on the economy, I mean, you know, Zimbabwe's economy is about $29 billion um, dollars, uh, in terms of GDP. We've talked a bit about mining, this uh, tourism, this carbon markets, this agriculture. Um, you know, Zimbabwe, I think, relative to other African countries has tremendous human capital and the education system there was amazing. I mean, having grown up in South Africa, I went to school with and worked with incredibly bright Zimbabweans, actuaries, lawyers, um, you know, the English and math was always better than mine. Um, so, I mean, I just, you know, kind of, you know, I, you know, I, I kind of had wanted to ask you just maybe very quickly so we can make sure to take the last few questions, but, you know, what is there to be excited about in terms of the economy, um, you know, as a young Zimbabwean, you know, what, what are you looking forward to? What do you want the government to deliver for you? So, so basically our, our demands or expectations, um, whichever word is, is, is more palatable there, as, as young people in Zimbabwe have always been the same. Uh, we need a functional country in terms of the laws, um, in terms of issues to do with corruption. So I think corruption mainly is one of the biggest issues recently, um, because I've always argued that, you know, the government has been pushing for entrepreneurship, right? And indeed, many young people have um, tried venturing to entrepreneurship, myself included. But what I've come to realize is that you cannot outplan a dysfunctional um, government. I, for example, speaking of myself personally, I run a small piggery project and I lost about 150 kilograms of pork when electric when electric when there was an electricity outage and i tried running to the supermarket to buy ice blocks to throw in the freezer but you cannot you simply cannot outmaneuver the failure failings of the government so if the government can assist us in this can not assist us rather but can deliver on its mandate to make sure that the environment we operate in is is is, is good in terms of the electricity the road network then, of course, giving another example of another, another entrepreneur, I think on the same issue of the freeze that I complained about, Kudam Sasiwa, another entrepreneur in Zimbabwe, has complained about this whole issue of the, the, you know, the cold chain on how the government frustrates you. Irrigation, you need electricity. So if the government can deliver on that, that's what we're expecting. Another thing also is, I, again, I touched on the issue of corruption. I think another entrepreneur, again, Tinashe Mtaris, who runs Nash Pains, also eventually tweeted and said, you know, some of the things that we go through, we just can't talk about them, but you guys are making it difficult for us to, to, to operate. And now Tinashe is like, is, um, I think it seems as if we've lost Disney. I think you should continue, Adio. <laughs> All right. So Tinashe is one of the most prominent Zimbabwean now, self-made millionaire, so to speak. But he came out also complaining about the level of corruption. So generally, as Zimbabwean young people, what we are expecting what we are expecting is a, a country that functions where at least if you are pushing us to be entrepreneurs, at least there should be functional laws, there should be functional uh, models of funding, not like during the, the previous uh, government led by uh, Robert Mugabe, where funding for young people's projects was only available as long as you told the party line. And sadly, there was no monitoring and valuation, and many of the young people got that money, mm -hmm. went and uh, paid bright price with uh, money meant for business. And here we are again. So I think since Jesna is back, I'll pause here. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, sorry about that. I'm on my phone now. Um, for some reason, my, my laptop uh, was frozen. Um, thanks very much. And I'm sorry that I, I missed uh, the comments that you just made, um, Adia. We're, we're having quite the, the webinar this morning. But um, we did have um, some questions. Uh, we had a question on... Um, the, the CCC and uh, on whether, oh, this is the one I want to take. Do the panelists think that CCC will be able to make a tangible difference 
um, and in development in the provinces where they've won gover governorship, for example, in Bulawayo. Um, I'm going to jump in briefly, if I may, before I defer to, to Knox and to Adio. I think that uh, in that CCC has, has made a relatively strong showing in the local government elections and, and also in, in areas such as Bulawayo, there is the potential for them to make a difference. I don't think that it ne it's necessary that there will be political gridlock, although, of course, there is the potential for that. But this has been the problem of opposition politics before, is that they haven't um, taken advantage of the of the platforms and uh, okay the the avenues that um, in local politics to sort out and to, to make sure that they have a credible alternative offering. Part of the problem of how South Africa viewed um, MDC in past years was that that, that okay for instance uh, President Thabo Mbeki did not regard them as a credible government in waiting. So I think that there is certainly an opportunity for CCC to build upon its relative electoral advantages, but it is going to need to focus carefully and considerately on that rather than using uh, the advantages of local representation to solve the problems of the bus stop, as it were. In other words, to be drawn into um, and, uh, the effectively corrupt practice rather than engaging with the needs of their voters rather than satisfying their own individual need and the advantages that could accrue from uh, local or, or, or national representation. So the opportunity is there. I think the jury's out on whether they take advantage of it. Thank you very much. Um, we've got a question from Humi Ahmed, uh, returning to um, just the Africa Climate Summit. I don't know if this, this one is um, difficult for me to take. Maybe Knox, you will know, uh, or Sue, maybe you will know. You've basically, what, what is the Zimbabwean government strategy with regard to adaptation and tourism in Zimbabwe? Do you, does the government have uh, a climate strategy? Um, I don't know to what extent they were presented in, in Kenya. It's not uh, part of the summit that I follow closely, but I don't know if e any of you have a view on climate strategy and adaptation um, in Zimbabwe. I'm afraid um, I don't have that question. If I may, I'll just speak very briefly on that. I'm, I'm not an expert, but I have spoken with uh, some of the Zimbabwe tourism um, authorities and um, they are, Zimbabwe is very much engaged um, in climate and environment issues because, of course, it affects Zimbabwe as, as well. Um, you know, we had a pattern of kind of great rains and then no rains and so on and so on. So Zimbabwe is very much involved um, at regional level. Um, they did, there was a representative at, at the Kenya uh, Climate Summit. So um, in short, Zimbabwe is, is very much aware of it and they are involved um, and they are also seeking to, they want to be part of the conversation. Thank you very, very much for that, um, Knox. I suppose um, the, we've got two minutes and there's one question that I've not addressed. Um, just returning again to the mining sector, how can Zimbabwe leverage on the mining sector, which is increasingly becoming informalized as well? Hmm. Um. Okay, no, maybe I'll, I'll just say very brief and then others perhaps can, can quickly come in. I think that there's, there's, there's two things in, in this. Um, the, the first is, um, you know, there's all these mega mining deals um, happening. Uh, I think government, from what I understand, is working to ensure that um, the, the mining deals and so on, that there is a downstream community uh, impact. I think this, this is happening quite recently. And, uh, uh, President Mnangagwa in his inauguration speech alluded to that. Um, so that, that's the, the one thing. I think the other thing is to handle the issue of security um, around the mining sector because there's so much, there's been a lot of violence, there's been a lot of criminality and so on and so forth. And for investors to come in, I think government will need to address the issues um, around security in the mining sector. Um, and I, again, people I've spoken to are very aware of, of that issue. Yeah, I think um, we should probably wrap up there because it's hit uh, 12 on the dot um, here in London and 1 p.m. in Southern Africa. Um, thank you very much to our knowledgeable panellists. You've been amazing. There's been a, a wide range. I think our audience really kept us on our toes um, this morning. 
<laughs> the, the very wide ranging um, questions. And thank you very much to our audience for joining and being so engaged. And uh, we appreciated you joining us today and for your questions. Many thanks again to Adio, Knox, and Sue, um, who've joined us on this webinar today. Until next time. Thank you, Desney. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you.